Hello and a very warm welcome in the App Philharmonie. We are actually in the lobby of the 13th floor, sitting in a round with six people, four singers and one conductor and myself. I'm the spokesperson of the hall, the press guy, so to speak. Tom's my name. And we are discussing tonight, today, whenever you're going to watch this, we are discussing the I would say the centerpiece of this year's International Music Fest Hamburg, which is Song of America, a celebration of black music, a wonderful series of stream concerts that have turned miraculously one that we are going to show with full orchestra and all singers in a live situation actually, which is uh, wonderful for us because we haven't had any audience in the hall for seven months. And it is such a relief and such a joy for us to have you here opening, reopening this kind of prestigious building and concert hall with this particular special program. So we are very, very happy and I will just introduce briefly my guests tonight, beginning with Louise Toppin, the singer and scholar and co-curator of the whole thing, the, the project I would say. Leah Hawkins, soprano singer as well, singing wonderfully and powerfully in this, in this program. Then, by order of how we continue, the spiritus rector of the whole program, which is Thomas Hampson, the world-famous baritone from endless operas and songs, and the person who has actually really done this Song of America cycle for over 20 years, or almost 20 years now, I think. The conductor of the orchestra that's going to perform is Roderick Cox, a wonderful musician, a wonderful person and a great, great conductor. And we have the tenor, Lawrence Brownlee, who is also singing in this program. So I think the first obvious question would go to Thomas because he has instigated and initiated the whole thing. And maybe you'd tell us briefly and if you wish it so, you can converse with Louise because she is so deeply involved in the, in the creation of the whole thing. How did this all come about? Well, it, it <laughs> pretty pretty serendipitous and pretty fortuitous. Uh, I'm also very good friends with Christoph Lieben, who is the executive director of this incredible organization. And we were having lunch last late August, September, I think. And the tensions were very high in the world, uh, and especially in America. There was a great deal of anger and hate. <coughs> Portland was on fire. Uh, Detroit has been on fire for some time. George. Floyd was not going, Floyd was not going away, obviously, people were very concerned. Um, and there was a, it was a new momentum in the Black Lives Matter movement here in Europe. Uh, and because I do live here, and I was seeing so many different reports of, of Black Lives Matter and the concerns in America and where a democratic society should go and diversity and all these. You know, I looked at Christopher and I said, this is exactly what the arts can do. This is what we can do. We can let everyone hear each other. And it says, it, it, I said to him, it seems to me that over here as much sympathy as there is for the Black Lives Matter movement, of which we are not a member. I, don't, I want to be very respectful for that. This is not about that. Uh, and that's why it's called a celebration of black music. Um, I said, I, I, I think Europeans would like to know what this cultural heritage has given the American culture that we in America ignore. It's been like a parallel universe to the creativity, especially in the 20th century, of uh, classical music in America. Um, and that needs to stop. My belief is that, and that's the whole thrust of Song of America. It's, I started celebrating 250 years of, of classic song, poetry set to music, um, 1759, written by a written by a Francis Hopkins and a very close friend of George Washington. Uh, and we've had this tradition all the way through and we had Wondrous Free and we had Beyond Liberty. Uh, we have a wonderful website, songofamerica.net. And in that, uh, in that exploration of American culture and the story of our culture, seen through the eyes of our poets and our composers, there is no color boundary in that. Uh, and and I love this music and for some years have been deeply aligned with the uh, African American Song Alliance run by a very close friend of ours, Daryl Taylor. And of course, you can't talk about 
song in America and, and African American heritage in classic song without meeting, talking to the wonderful Louise Topp. And so I, Christopher said, yes, I think that's a great idea. Absolutely, let's do it. I said, well, we're going to need two or three concerts, you know, and we started already sort of thinking about it. And he said, we have to do this. We have to do this. We'll talk about it. Yeah, get it together. Send me something. Tell me what to listen to. Uh, he was completely open. And, and that was the first conversation. And the second conversation was with my managing director, Christy Finn, who I, I really want to name as, a, as an unbelievable power of, as scholar and as managing director of my foundation, which is the housing organization of Song of America dot net. Uh, but first call was, was to Louise, and Louise, no one, we've known each other as, as scholars, but haven't spent that much physical time together, so I was a little bit nervous, you know, and I said, well, Louise, I got this thing I'm thinking about, what do you think, you know? And, and your reaction was instantaneous, and in that first phone call, Zoom call, we just started planning things and great ideas and what we could come up with, and I said, probably it's going to be more difficult to form what we can't do. <laughs> How was that for you? Was it that like finally he's calling me? Because I mean, you have been singing this repertoire for decades. Right, right. Oh, it was it was fantastic, and the idea of bringing on colleagues such as these who will help us to amplify this music in an important way. Because you're right, I've been singing it, and others have been performing it, but you know, not necessarily getting the visibility that the music should have and the place that it should have. So it takes many more people and, and uh, to make this happen. We were very intentional about the programs that we put together as we thought about Langston Hughes and the connections to the United States and uh, expatriate uh, composers like Robert Owens here. We did a second program that has a little bit of um, social protest, not social protest, but social responses is a part of what we were intentionally, as we talked about it, but all each artist brought to the table repertoire that was already important and meaningful to them. And if they didn't know something or wanted to learn something, they were fantastic about diving in and 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 willingly taking suggestions from me, um, even though they didn't they didn't know what they were getting into. <laughs> and I, I want to add the third prong to that was that once we got the green light, you know, in, over the over the beginning of the year, uh, that we were going to do this, then the Elb Philharmonie kicked in, and it was it was Barbara Levitch and 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 Christoph uh, Lieben who said, "We'd like you to get to know Roderick Cox," and I said, "With pleasure." And so they sent a lot of materials, and I'd heard his name because of you winning the the Schulte, but I don't follow the conductor's world so much. So very quickly it became conversations, not so much about what we'd like to play, but what can we play given COVID. Uh, and, but Roderick came in right at the beginning and, and left us in peace with, with all of these recital things, but, but the orchestra texture con construct uh, was, was really thankful to your, to your expertise in, in the repertoire. And also being able to, and, and lit literally looking at the scores, that that's just not going to happen. We're just not going to be able to do that, or maybe we can. Anyway, I'll let you tell that. Yeah, tell us a bit more about it. I mean, the idea of incorporating the Negro Folk Symphony was actually Thomas's idea. Is that correct? Oh, well, yes, actually. Thomas, uh, he... It's my fault. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I, I had already... I heard of the Negro Folk Symphony before. I've never given it time. Um, I think because I was, it it had a sort of negative connotation because the, the, the title of it um, is not necessarily politically correct today. So I just never really uh, listened to it. Even though it's from 1931. Uh, yes, so uh, but I was familiar with the Florence Price Symphony and so forth. And I remember the night uh, it was a night time in Berlin. It was winter. Uh, Thomas uh, proposed this, and immediately, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm like, I don't know this. I'm not doing it. Um, but I said, I'm going to go for a jog, and I will, well, let me listen to this. And I started listening, and I'm thinking, wait, hold on. Wait. I mean, is this, and then I'm, you know, this is, this is really good stuff. I mean, there's more to this. And it was like every day I was listening to it uh, through my jogs in the morning, and I'm just like, it's great music, and it, it, it was a no-brainer. I said, why isn't 
Why isn't this piece known? Why isn't it in the standard repertoire? We, we have to do this. I have to learn this piece. Uh, and that has to be the one we do. Um, and thankfully for that, because I think this piece, the Negro Folk Symphony, um, should certainly be in the repertoire and among um, some of the greatest symphonies uh, written. It, it, it takes the, the sort of, it takes these folk tunes and Dawson is the only, is the only symphony he wrote uh, in his early 30s, which is so sad because he just could not get the momentum he needed as a composer. But um, it's as compact uh, as, as Brahms III, um, but as innovative as Beethoven's Fifth with how it takes motive germs and, and morphs them um, through the entire symphony. It has the, 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 the sass, uh, the, the attitude of Bartok, and it has the sort of imagination of otherworldly things of a Mahler symphony. And so it, it, it's incredible in that way. And he wrote it and put that title to it because he did not want any question um, for people to think that this music didn't come from a person of color. Um, because that was a reaction from him hearing Dvorak's Ninth Symphony at the time and people questioning, um, saying, oh, these melodies are not, Dvorak did not seek inspiration from uh, African-American people for this music. This is Czech music, or this is Native American music. And the people at the time, the, the, the American uh, black musical scholars, they knew Absolutely. where those influences came from. And so he said, I want there to be no doubt. And this was, you know, this period of the Harlem Renaissance where you had these wonderful uh, high artists, uh, people of color, and they wanted to put their stamp and their culture in their, in their music or on their work. And so to, to really label it Negro Folk Symphony at the time was this huge moment of pride. Um, and so for me, and I think for all of us, just to embrace that. And it's, it's been a pleasure really working on this music uh, with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And the second movement, movement is called Hope in the Night. So, this gives, the night. Yes. so this gives the entire program of this uh, night its title, which is of course also, you know, with all the double sense and the, the illusions and overtones such a, such a phrase has. And of course we feel like this is maybe a moment of hope in the night that has happened in so many ways politically for, for, for you folks and, and to really say, wow, there's something changing. You said it so beautifully, Thomas, recently, that we are living in a new now now. So there has some, something has changed, really. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, we have three nights. We have two nights with uh, songs in the recital hall. We have this night in the big grand hall. Leah, you think how, how many percent of what would deserve to be performed in our hall? How little is what we have actually m are able to present in these three concerts, in these three days? Is it huge, the, the amount of things we have no, n not a freaking idea about? Oh, absolutely. As Tom said, we had to narrow it down. It was hard to choose repertoire. And even what we came up with uh, ended up being vast. And, and um, there's lots and lots of music, and there was so much more that we could have chosen. Um, I'm happy with what has been uh, presented, for sure. But this is just for starters, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, if I could jump in, I also think, um, I, and you know, it is upsetting, I think publishers have to do better at preserving this music and making it readily available. The parts, you know, w just just getting the, our hands on the material is a struggle. And when our hands are on the material, there, there are errors and there are wrong notes and, and we have to be meticulous because there's a measure missing there or there are too many measures. And this does a, a, a huge injustice to composers of color and uh, these artists because their music is not able to take flight because they're, they're just not, you know, I can walk into any store down the street probably and buy a Brahms, uh, a set of Brahms symphonies, Pockets, you know, yeah. and so forth in, in, in several editions. But to get 
my hands on a Dawson symphony, it's like I have to go through an act of Congress um, and the parts are, are an issue. And so hopefully, as you said, that this is a movement which says that there is a demand for this stuff and publishers need to take the responsibility of preserving this music and, and taking care of it. So it, it makes it easier um, to, to, to share it, mm -hmm. simply. Lawrence, what's your experience with this material? I mean, we are used to having leader bücher, you know, with the lyrics and, uh, and a piano version of it. Would you echo uh, Roderick's perception that there is so little material, or is it also because there was so much oral tradition going on? Oh, well, I have to say that um, the practice of this music now is becoming more and more common. Uh, Leah's a bit younger than I am. I know I'm in the middle, I guess we should say. And when I was growing up uh, as a young singer, I guess we can say, uh, we didn't, there wasn't a practice like there is today of us doing this music. And so, as Roderick said, it's not readily available. Uh, some of the things that you have is only an orchestral version, and some people ha have had to work in this process to break those down to piano and vocal. I think one of our colleagues, Joseph Joubert, for this program, for this program yeah. Joseph wow. Joubert, uh, broke down a few things so we could have a piano vocal because it just didn't exist. And so people are having to do the work uh, to put it in front of people's, uh, people's eyes. And I, and I echo what Roderick said, is that um, this is incredible music. As Leah said, uh, and as everyone has said, we've had to really narrow it, narrow it down. And myself having sung, I don't know, 20 plus years, uh, so much of this music is unknown to me, and it's a shame. It's incredible music. Uh, there are so many young composers now and so many forgotten composers that we haven't even mentioned. And, you know, talking to both of these people is like, you know, going to an encyclopedia because they have so much knowledge. And they're telling me of all these people that I have never, ever heard of. But, of course, you know of Purcell, you, you know of Quilty, you know of many of the other composers, um, well, American as well. But you don't know of these wonderful composers, and I think this is an, a shame. But hopefully with people like, of course, Thomas and Louise and others that are pushing this music, it will be much more a part of the, the canon of song literature and that it will be, per be performed not only in America, but all around the world. And, um, uh, you know, so I, when Thomas, I, I don't think I told you this, but Thomas brought the Dawson, told me of the Dawson, and then I texted a colleague um, at the Aspen Music Festival who, um, who told James Conlon and so James Conlon is going to do it at Aspen Music Festival and at the Baltimore Symphony. Then I told a colleague who's the new music director of the Lati Symphony, and she's going to do it in Lati. <laughs> and so, so it's catching fire now. Yes, so. So, but now it's my responsibility to say, okay, uh, first violins, they're missing this measure, this entire measure in this part. Let's, let's coordinate after this program. And so I can say, okay, that that note is missing there and we need to do that and and hopefully the publishers will collect that information because i want the next conductor or the next the next artist who has experience with this repertoire for it to be a bit easier um and you know hopefully all of these great singers presenting it in such a hall like this at a stage like this they will start to put it a part of their um other artists will take it and put, a part, put it as a part of their recital uh, series. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think one of the very exciting things is that as the programs, especially the recital programs were coming together, was that we had easily 50% living composers. Mm -hmm. This is, and, and, and to quote Marilyn Horne's favorite title of her programs, The Song Continues. That's, I think, one of the most exciting things. And they're, and they're mostly, in, in, from where I sit, young composers. We're talking about a, a, a classic song. Classic song being defined as poetry set to music. And of course there's gray areas on both sides of that, but, but this, this driving passion to create moments of humanity through poetry and music is alive and well. And, and what I also want to say to our public is that you've already heard Larry say it, you've heard all of us say it, 
people feel intimidated because they don't know the music or they don't, well, I've never heard of that person. I, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a Kulturbanause, you know, and, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I had an interview on Idadra with, with Anthony Green, a very young, vibrant composer whom we sang one of his new pieces on, on the thing. And he was telling the story of he and his partner, Ashley, and they have this wonderful um, Castles of the Skin project, right? And it was born out of the idea, you know, we should be concentrating more on African-American composers. And they kind of looked at each other, well, I, I know one, two, three, do you, do you know, do you know? And they came up with like 12 names. <laughs> how, many, how many names do you have on your database? We have 4,000 songs. 4,000, right? You <laughs> Just know. me. So, you know, there's a, there is a possibility of momentum here. And, and, I, and I love your point about the publishers. I, I want to offer a, a passion of mine would be, and Louise and I have talked about this, we both have a couple of organizations that are doing what they can. I, th I, think, I think we need to help publishers. I think we need to try and set up a fund that's about helping them do what they need to do for material because publishers are also in living in, in difficult times. Uh, they live from the rental or from the sales of, of things. I mean, they're not, sometimes they can play a pretty hard ball and they haven't been the easiest people, but I understand that, you know? And if you, if you know anything about song, if you, if you read the letters of Robert Schumann, it's not much different, you know? It's just, you just have to, you have to move through that world. So I think there's a lot of possibilities. The other thing I do want to say, and Larry, you mentioned the age thing. Uh, we had two young singers, Justin Austin and Emma Nikolovska, a Canadian and an American German young baritone and a mezzo soprano. My passion for everything I do right now is to create a place where young people can sing. You cannot become a singer unless you sing. You can't become a musician unless you play music, but especially singers. And I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled that, that my younger colleagues, of which you are kind of halfway in there, but <laughs> I've just admired you for so much on the, on the opera stage. This guy, this guy can sing the phone book, and you just, <laughs> well, you're sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, these different emphasis in the whole program, I, I, can't, I cannot be happier. And I'm, I'm, I cannot tell you what it meant when Roderick said, you're right, it's an important symphony. Mm -hmm. I felt so justified. <laughs> yeah. I felt like, you know, because I'm just a stupid singer, you know. <laughs> and I was like, <gasps> he likes it. <laughs> well deserved. Yeah. But yeah. that's so. how this, this builds is, you know, you saying this is important to other people, to other people. That's the way we're going to convince the publishers that it's important because we've been trying to convince the recording industry as well as publishing. It's a vicious cycle. Music can't be printed if people don't know what it sounds like and they demand it. And so breaking that cycle is what we've just done and what we hope will be a fire that's lit in multiple places. You've just said five places that the same symphony that's had very few performances since very the 1930s. Mm -hmm. It was a, a powerhouse when it still and Price's symphonies all hit the scene at the same time in America, made a huge splash and then nothing for all three of them, still continued to rise, but Price spent the rest of her life trying to get a piece that was premiered by the Chicago Symphony ever played again. She couldn't in her lifetime. She kept going to Boston, kept going to Boston. And, and they wouldn't. And so, hmm? They wouldn't. They would not. Kusevitsky, she kept writing him. I've seen the, the, uh, the correspondence. The letters. The letters. Now, Philadelphia Orchestra will play all four for symphonies next season. <laughs> yes. And I think, yeah, they will play all four. And mm -hmm. so this is a def oh, an interesting period. It's, it's sad that a, that a person had to die to open up this movement. But if you think of movements, that's usually how they happen. And the civil rights movement was, was really jumped off after Emmett Till's murder, you know, when people said, this is enough. I can't believe they could do this to a kid. And so obviously these issues have been happening. And then I just think during COVID, it was this part where the world was already frozen because people were asked to sit and, 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 you know, stay in. And so everyone could really focus instead of, oh, I got a meeting to go to and, you know, really focus and see on the television that this could happen for this amount of time to a, to a human being. And then I think in corporate America, in, in classical music, in, in all forms of, 
you know, walks of life, people just started to grapple with these questions of like, hmm, this is, you know, this is a problem. How do we fix this? You know, you said something I think is really important. You said that people were doing so many things, but with COVID, you couldn't ignore it. Mm -hmm. It's easy to mm -hmm. ignore it when you have so many different um, places, distractions, things coming at you in every direction. But I had so many of my friends and colleagues that reached out to me and they said, wow, I'm sorry. I was not willfully ignoring the things that you as African-Americans have been going through, but I understand. And that, how, that is the reason why I, it has become a global movement. As you said, you know, I think Thomas said, yeah. in places in Germany, in Japan, in Italy, all over the world, people were talking about Black Lives Matter. And so with us now, we feel that we have the, I feel that I have the obligation and the responsibility to be a champion for this music. I feel that it's important for me to program these on recitals and concerts because we are a representation. And I think people are at a place to listen to us in a different way because they see the importance of our message. And I tell people all the time, you cannot tell the story of America without talking about black people. Black people and that story is a part of the DNA of America. And it is such an integral part of what uh, our history is. And now people are finally realizing it which is good, but I think it takes, you know, important artists like the ones that are sitting in front of you to be the champions for it and everyone else will see the worth, the worthiness of this music, which I think is absolutely at a very high level. I would like to, to add some European perspective here because we have, uh, I personally have grown up, you know, with, with jazz, with what Miles Davis called great black music. So for us in Europe, we felt like we are the good ones. You know, we, w there were the, the black musicians like Sidney Bichet or like, like uh, the saxophone player who lived in, in, in Paris or Charlie Don Cherry Charlie went. Parker. Charlie Parker. Yeah, or Dexter Gordon who, who moved to Paris Dexter for a long Gordon, time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don Cherry in Scandinavia, many black musicians going to Scandinavia where they felt like they are for one respected as a person mm -hmm. and not persecuted. Yep. And for two, the music is really loved. I mean, you might remember Round Midnight, this movie from the mid 90s, where the French people were all just like totally glued to this music. And Miles Davis would come to, to Paris to record for Let's go, um, the Chafot music, you know. So, but this is all oral tradition or recorded music. So there's rarely uh, a score. And there seems to be a gap between great American songbook, oftentimes also written forth by black musicians and what we are talking about here, composed music that needs some score in order to be interpreted. Without question, if I, if I can address a couple of those points, and that was, the, that was actually one of the impetus being, being an American, but having found my home in, in Europe, I'm very, I'm very aware of these two poles all the time. And it was, it was, a, it was my passion in this project, especially under the Song of America, that people would hear in Europe the sound of America, and especially the sound, the essence of the African American experience, not seen through white eyes, and not being okayed by a dominant culture that, okay, well, we're gonna let that stuff in. That's got to stop. To me, democracy is with a capital D, and a capital D of democracy without a capital D of diversity doesn't mean anything. And if you want to hear diversity, come to this concert. Hear, hear, hear the sound of democracy. The idea that we have <clears throat> different strains of, of subcultures within an American culture is an, is an anathema to me. It doesn't, make any, it doesn't make any sense to what the power of e pluribus unum should be. I, I, I found a, reading an article of, of uh, Reverend um, Al Sharpton, and he was just, you know, he's been, he's been wonderfully articulate. And, and, you know, he said, it's not about being, you know, we saw, oh, I'm colorblind. Or there's no more, there's no, I, I don't see you in your colors. That's, to deny color is, is exactly the wrong thing to do. I want you to celebrate my blackness because I want to celebrate your whiteness or your Chineseness or your Latinness or your, and this, you know, America is a, is a, is a geographical political construct of myriad cultures. And why we have this issue of racism through our entire history at the level and depth 
and an obscenity that we have had doesn't make any sense to me. I literally mean that. It just seems illogical to me. I guess you have to get down to some sort of basic human nature of power and so forth before you weave through that. But it, it makes no sense to the power of what America is to, to limit any particular part of this enormous power of diversity that we have. And this is what we must, to do that, we must n understand how we all sound. And I think you hear human beings sound in poetry and in music. I find this very beautiful also, you know, the sound, the, the sheer quality of sound. Speaking of you, Leah, when you sing, I, I can literally, and gives me goosebumps right now when I think of you singing. <laughs> it really gives the, the image We've and had the all impression. We've that. You, you, you've all gone through <laughs> that, right? Of the entire history of, of the black Americans in a way. And, and how, how aware are you of that? Is this just coming out of your nature or are you, are you just so sincere that you really carry that torch in well, order to make sure that it's really being heard? You know, I, it's genetic. We carry all of that. I carry my mother, my father, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother was illiterate and my grandmother, her daughter was born on a plantation. I carry that. Um, and that comes through my singing, whether I decide to or not. And my experiences as a black person come through my singing. Me being stopped longer at uh, customs it comes, through, comes through my singing. Uh, me being treated poorly um, in the grocery store comes through my singing. All of that um, is a part of me. And so I think that's what you hear when I do, when I do sing. I bring that to everything. And black artists in particular bring that to everything. And that's why there's such a special quality to what we do. And it speaks to people like you and me. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so obvious and so resonant, so mm -hmm. deeply resonant in human. Being able to push through despite. And it's sad, I don't want to have to push through. Sometimes I just want to be. I don't want to have to deal with, with those thoughts and those actions. But you are being me. confronted with, with it on a daily basis. Regularly. And yeah. um, not yeah. just in America, but I've had it in Europe. And <laughs> it, it just, you know, and you know, the, sitting on this during COVID has made me realize how much I have suppressed. And I didn't realize there were things that I've done because of that. And there are things that I do in travel and preparation that I do because in the back of my mind, I know that things could happen to you me. You anticipate. I anticipate and I don't even realize, it's, uh, it's subconscious. Mm -hmm. Automatic, yeah. You made a comment earlier that I wanted to just briefly touch on. You're right, Europeans have been the good guys. You're absolutely right, and that's also my passion. Walt Whitman was far better known uh, internationally before we actually sort of got the drift <laughs> in America. We're still struggling with him, but <laughs> he's, he's a great bard of democracy. But for instance, Langston Hughes also found an international resonance uh, in Europe, and that's not just a matter of paying, oh, we like, the, I li we like what he's right. Europeans have always, from Tocqueville forward, have been looking for the voices, and usually the artists, usually writers, and usually poets, to tell the real story of being an American, being disenfranchised, not being part of the, you know, wh whatever all that breakdown of our society can be. Europeans have been deeply curious of that, and that's what Christoph and I were talking about. I said, I think it's time to do that. And it was very interesting in, in some of the conversations I had talking about this project is that Friend and I told my, my colleagues, I told Louise, I said, you know, the Europeans very often don't make a distinction between spirituals, gospel, black music. They'll put jazz over here and, and that other thing I'm not even going to mention because I don't want to give it any legs. But the different kinds of black music, as you're saying, and, and um, you, you mean this stuff's written out by somebody? The fact that in, in 2021 someone can even answer, ask that question is an is a, is a failure of liberal arts education in America, in my opinion. That's how strongly I feel about it. It's just wrong. It's just stupid. It's not stupid, it's ignorant. And this is wrong. And that's part of what we wanted to show on this concert, the variety of, of we talked about younger composers, but we wanted to honor the historic composers that people don't know either. And so we pulled all the way from the beginning with Harry Burley, the first person to set art song, uh, spirituals in an art song setting at the turn of the 20th century, all the way up to Jasmine Barnes and, and the other young composers. So that was really important, but it was also important for us to show spirituals, vernacular music, which is what we were showing on the orchestral concert, opera arias, and then songs on 
the, the two recitals because we wanted to show that African Americans have written all styles successfully of African uh, of music of which their um, spirituals are the root music for a lot of this, including the Dawson. Those tunes are coming out of that experience. So we were very careful in programming as we thought about it, how to connect all the pieces of the program together. What's really interesting also is, um, I, I suppose this is, I mean, as a classical musician, this was a very interesting program because you start with music that's in your source material, music you've heard or grown up listening to, rhythms and grooves that are that's within you. Um, you know, when uh, coming from Macon, Georgia, or from from Iowa, or where or Philadelphia, or so forth, when we come to Europe or when we study classical music, you know, we're studying. Okay, what is the uh, what is the waltz? What is that? How does that feel? Or oh, the polonaise? Okay, and oh, what is that Austrian music? And you know, you haven't been there. You're trying to imagine it, or you you try to study the style to, or you know. What is what is a Brahms string sound supposed to sound like? But for this, you know, it's like okay, the spiritual is here in the symphony, or it's it's about this. Oh, I know that tune. Oh, I know these rhythms. Oh, it feels like this. And so, it's been really fun, kind of now, <laughs> I guess, feeling like you have a leg up on the the German orchestra because <laughs> you're, s you're trying to explain. You know, this has to. This has to jive a little bit. It has to, <laughs> it has to Teach groove, to swing. you know. Yeah. It has to swing. It has to lay back on it and feel feel the yada da yada da, you know, in the symphony. Um, it's not cheesy, but it's it, you know how how it's how it's incorporated in the music is brilliant. But it's been very interesting to explore that in this setting at the Elper Homony with the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie. Yeah, I, I want to jump in there to say one of the first phone calls also was to my good friend Hans Otto who runs the, the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie in, in Bremen. And it was just an explosion of just, just an immediate, oh yes, we have to do this. Oh yes, oh just, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, we got to do this. This is how this orchestra is. And you've had three days, four days with them. And they're they fantastic. they love Roderick. And I mean, they've been coming, I've sung with them a couple of times and they, we know each other. And they say, you know, I don't know where you got this guy, but this is great. And, and one, the concert master comes and says, thank you for letting us play this music. I mean. That's incredible. Yeah, one That's must be aware incredible. that Leonard Bernstein was maybe the first conductor ever who who would teach some Americanism to true. to uh, European orchestras because nobody you know you were drilled not to play this way, <laughs> <laughs> and now <laughs> the ability to to use this and to enjoy it actually even you more. Think Bernstein was was dramatically powerfully vested in civil rights, mm. and he was the mentor of many major African American composers and, and artists. He didn't play a lot of this music. Mm. I'll why? leave it at that. Yeah. You know, well, sadly. I will say, I, you asked why and believe it like that. As a guest, as a conductor, as an African-American conductor, traveling the world, I have to somehow be very careful how I program um, music, uh, certainly by African-American composers, um, because you don't want to risk the chance of being um, typecast as, oh, you know, th this, is, this is that, or they only do that kind of stuff. And so I have to be very careful, like if I'm doing, I'm doing the Negro Symphony with the Seattle Symphony next, next year and so I have that on the first tab and then I have the Glazunov Violin Concerto and then the Bartok Miraculous Mandarin Suite mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and, and, and so I think that's how the music should be integrated into our programs. Um, but what's been fascinating and thankfully to Thomas and Louise and all of these artists is too many Basically, too many people are just lazy about what they don't know and not doing enough research to find it. So people will say, oh, um, we need to do, 
uh, a program, but with some diverse composers. You find uh, some music by a diverse composer. Instead of saying, we want to do a program, could you find some wonderful music you love by uh, a female composer or uh, wonderful music by a, a black composer that you love? That just immediately starts with a, a a, a different type of positivity around putting a program together versus... And trust into you as an artist. Yeah, instead of saying, oh, but we need to include something by some, you know, then it feels, you know... It's not artificial. Not it's authentic. getting artificial or political. I, I hope we can get to beyond that, even to the point where they say, program wonderful music, and that the conductors all say, well, that means I need to represent a lot of things, a lot of perspectives that someone doesn't have to say even make it a diverse, you know, or what, uh, that even still feels, why, why don't they just tell you to program wonderful music? Well, we live in a globalized society now, and it's not just an Italian audience or German audience. You have so many different people who come and want to see the Elf Philharmonie, and uh, sitting in the hall, people now want to hear things that's not just a, Wagner, Siegfried, Idyll, Strauss' four last songs, and then Mahler's fourth symphony. I love the piece. Oh, that sounds like a great program. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that no. still was a good program, actually. <laughs> that is a great program. <laughs> but it would be great if there was some other stuff in there as well. We want to hear, I think people are craving for good music from different places, different voices. Well, I think there's a real rebound off this pandemic. Uh, the, the few live concerts I've been allowed to do in the last 12 months. It, it, it's like singing to, to mainlining people, you know, it's just, it's, ever, it's absolutely dead silent. And I think, I think everybody's got new ears. Uh, I hope the orchestras, uh, and, and Louise, you should talk about a couple of weeks ago, you, you expanded the, your, the Af African uh, diaspora musical project. Yes. Is that it? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, database. right? Uh -huh. And with the 4,000 titles of, for, for singers, we now have 1,500 titles for orchestras. And so the American Orchestra League had, had Professor, Dr. 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 Professor Louise Toppin come, and, and because there's a, there's a big interest, they called and said, help us. Yeah. We don't know. Is that really well. true? Is that really that happening is now? That's so happening. That is yeah. true. Growing numbers yeah. that, that people would yeah. approach you and ask? Absolutely. Cool. And that's why I, I expanded the tool this year because conductors came to me and said, what's out there? But, you know, Roderick is right. The next step for us, and as, as Thomas said, is now we have to figure out how to get funds to create better parts so that it's workable, so that those that have done it, we can get that input and fix the, 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 the mistakes, because there are lots of mistakes, but absolutely, there is sincere interest. I've heard from opera houses. Um, I've done presentations to, I did Opera Theater of St. Louis recently talking about one of the composers. They wanted to know who, what African-American composers are there. So By the way, even as we speak, uh, opera Theater of St. Louis was going to do Porgy and Bess, but they had to cancel f because it was just too big and they couldn't do it with COVID restrictions. So they're doing, they're doing the one actor that we're singing the excerpts from uh, tomorrow of uh, Highway One of, of William Grant Still. And, you know, again, I, I, you're going to see a lot of organizations and record companies, they're going to they're gonna land on some of the, and, and it's right, we need to go through this period. Florence Price, should we should hear everything she wrote and so forth. But... I, I guess my personal, one of my personal passions is, first of all, where did the Harlem Renaissance go? It died in the Depression. Where did these pieces go? Was it rabid, rabid racism? Probably not rapid, but certainly insipid. But it was essentially a, an economic crunch, a fall through for a decade. You know, and you, I mean, it's all, all of this is tied up in, in, in the real history of, of America. but. My passion is without question for one composer that I, I feel is, is just really unfairly not in the pantheon of American musicians, and that's William Grant Still. We have done some songs of his, and, and, and the operas are, are really marvelous pieces, but his symphonic literature and his chamber literature, I mean, he's a, he is a, m m there's, it is inexcusable that he's not in the pantheon of, of the, or, or, or thought of in that way, but I hope he'll, he will come that way. So we still have some, you know, 
some fires to light and, and, and to go forward. But like I said, there is this parallel universe of amazing creativity. They don't all have to be incredible careers, but there has been a consistent creative output of the African-American poet and composer that has just not made it to the surface. And if this program does anything to sort of say, hey, it's over there, have a look, can only be happy. And, and again, if it, it can't happen without these colleagues, all of the, everybody I called wanted to do it, even some of them who didn't make it and said, do it again, I'll go to that one, or, or give me a little bit of, you know, I mean, there, there was just nobody that didn't believe in this project. And, and again, we're sitting in the Elbphilharmonie, one of the most now iconic arts organizations of Germany. Yes, ran, ran, run by one of my best friends. I'm, I'm <laughs> grateful, <laughs> but he he, so. he would not hesitate to you know. I mean, he runs the house. He doesn't run his friendship, right? But I mean, it, it, and and the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie. You know, this would not. These projects would not be happening if it weren't for this collective, huh? First with this concert, first with audience after COVID. And now with yeah, audience, yeah, yeah, I think I they're mean, all, we're all very excited about that. We're all slightly nervous. None Almost none kind of, of a historic None of us have been performing us. for yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, anyway, I don't I mean to dominate. I would like to, to point out to one thing that's really um, buzzing me a bit. You know, we have had many American orchestras coming to also to this beautiful hall. And even the orchestras, the instrumentalists, very few black men and women playing in, in the big American orchestras. Do you know, d do you have any close friends, black musician friends playing in the top notch American orchestras? Oh, yes. yeah. You yeah, have? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So several, many. Several. several. I have several friends of mine that play in Philadelphia, that play in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, that play in. Um, various orchestras at high levels. My best friend is Principal Tuba at New Mexico Symphony and teaches uh, tuba and euphonium there. And there are few, not like, you know, and the, the idea is in orchestras you have um, behind the curtain auditions and they're, you know, they listen to you without seeing you until the final round, I, I understand. And I don't know if anyone's the been first involved. Between the orchestras, but the I first, yeah, yeah, the orchestra is, uh, and so, um, I, I was going to say this earlier, oftentimes you don't see, if you want to call them our best musicians, there are many, is because uh, I think blacks have established themselves in such identifiable ways. For example, if you think of jazz, jazz is think, thought of universally as a black thing. If you think of gospel, a black, black thing. thing. If so you think of the thing that Thomas won't mention, <laughs> a black thing. Some of these <laughs> other things are such identifying factors that's a joke of course you know identifying and it says what we are as musicians we're in these specific things but classical music oftentimes you don't get an abundance of us going into this direction because we have such strongholds in other areas and so i've seen some of my very talented friends get high-ranking jobs in orchestras because they have the talent but because other areas pull at some of the great uh, black musicians you don't get oftentimes them in symphony and classical music because they're doing a various uh, array of different other styles that black people particularly excel in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's interesting to see that in Europe. I mean, that's one of the big topics we have, and we have spoken about the structural situation, especially in the classical music field, how little this is being represented. I mean, we've begun having in the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, I mean, Sabine Meyer, Berlin Philharmonic, they started hiring women just maybe a mere 30 years ago. <laughs> before it was like a huge, mm -hmm. uh, it was but a that was by design. That was by design, right? Yeah, it was sure. written it was. or understood. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I th yeah, and uh, these are incredibly important conversations. And I, I, I want to be, I want to be a person in the conversation that lowers the blood pressure because we've had a lot of people shaking the tree lately, talking about the racism in, in classical music, and I think we need to be very clear when we're talking about the repertoire and people like Beethoven and Mozart and Schumann and Schumann, all these people, the the repertoire and the lives that that have given us the evidence of human existence through music, versus an industry which is a 20th century phenomenon in its structure which carries with it other indices of of society and and certainly can be pointed at as having unfair on ramps if you will for for people of color uh, and disadvantaged people i mean look this is a bigger question than just 
oh, we're not going to let black study, uh, black play clarinet in that, that orchestra. I think we are past that time, but there's no question that a young, talented person of color is going to have a hard, harder time going through and getting into the proper training organizations. And that's the only way we're going to see truly uh, multicultural uh, symphonic players. But, you know, it, it, we're evolving. People evolve, and, and, and I don't want to put a Pollyanna on this. It's not all good news, but there is movement forward, and at least there's recognition of where real problems still are. Again, because of the unrest last June, there was this huge uh, uh, Zoom meeting from Los Angeles, and they all got it. And it was identified that no opera house in America had a person of color in the human resources department or leading it. It's possible. It's crazy, right? So it's time for us to, to, to shake those trees. And it can't just be because somebody is black that they have a job, but it should be reflective of the society that it's coming from. And these stories should mean as much to a white person as to a black person. It's the story of us. That's how I see it. Please well, do. I mean, it's true that uh, it doesn't need, we don't need to focus on the things you mentioned. Uh, one of the things that m I, myself, and many of my colleagues are really fighting for is just getting opportunities to be in places to make decisions. If you have the same people hiring all the time, you'll hire oftentimes what looks like you. And that doesn't mean you're deliberately trying to uh, not take someone else. But when you diversify who's making decisions, when who's programming, who's bringing, and how you market to to various areas, this is when you can have a true sense of diversity and a better, and I think a, a, a more further reaching outlook on what society is because you have different people in the room. But as long as the people that hire and fire and do all of these things are the same demographic, you'll get the same thing over and over again. So of course we want to infiltrate these positions. We want to have representation uh, in these places so we can begin to look at the world and this beautiful multi multicultural self and then just be able to pick from a wonderful pool, but we have a much broader view of what the world is. Wonderful, thank you. So I think we have covered some, some ground here, or at least dug a bit in the, in the, in the <laughs> ground and worked <laughs> up Not stuff. And, <laughs> and it's of course kind of an endless conversation because there are so many aspects that need to be, to be you know, seen and, and talked about. And I would just, invite for a little final round probably if you have a little gem or something that you really want to want to say and add beginning here and just doing the round later. Well, um, I want people to know that this music is for everyone. Um, if you sing American music with an accent, you sing it with an accent. We Americans sing Italian and German with our American accent, so you can do the same. Oh, God forbid. Oh, God forbid. Thank you, that's a relief. <laughs> Hold on there. <laughs> we try not to. No, we, we order lunch in our American accent, we sing it pretty good. All right, okay, there we okay. go. But they should be able to sing that's spirituals. In Absolutely. Yes, yes. Study the literature, but, but don't be afraid of it. Um, um, it, is, it is for everyone, and I, I want to, to, to push that. Um, I would just say that I hope that this program opens eyes and ears and uh, as Leah was saying, it allows people to think seriously about the stories that come out of America, that we're not all monolithic, but that we have a lot of stories to tell and that the, the stories of the African-American experience haven't been told yet through music and they are beautifully paired by these composers and sung and performed by um, instrumentalists as well. So I hope that people do take this music seriously, really dig into it. And as, as hard as I studied my German leader and my French, um, I hope that they will take that same seriousness and really enjoy the, the, enjoy the journey. There's lots there for everyone, absolutely. Well, I echo you know, my colleagues, uh, it's worthy music. Uh, let the music speak for itself. Open your eyes and your minds and your ears to really be touched by the experience. Uh, let the story be told to you without having some preconceived idea of what the black American experience is. And I think you will be taken on a journey and it, it can be life changing. I truly believe that. 
Well, I suppose I, I um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't feel the need to convince anyone that this is this is great music or you should take it seriously. Um, it's it's fantastic repertoire um, that we just so happen to have the opportunity to bring to the Elf Philharmonie with a great orchestra and uh, and with great artists and those are the ingredients for uh, any music to have to to gain their legs and to soar um, to have these voices and this orchestra and this hall together to do this to to this music to do this music is a really special thing and so I certainly thank Christoph and and Thomas and the Deutsche Kammer Philharmonie for committing themselves to this project and all of these singers and I hope everyone enjoy. Mm -hmm. Thomas, the final word? Yeah, I think I've said so you much. So much, <laughs> much. I, all I really want to say is thank you. It, that we're here, that I have met some new colleagues, that we have so many colleagues that are on this journey, which is a wonderful metaphor. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great life. And you have to you have to say you have to say thank you great when, life. When, it, when it comes together it, thank you, you know, creator it's a, it's yeah. a great Coming life together, i yes. just say thank you to you all yeah. thank you to the hall thank you to our public for opening your hearts and minds as you so rightfully said and come walk with us you'll love it so then thank you so much for having been here and conversed so wonderfully and and thoughtfully about this beautiful program and my last word would be a, a warm recommendation to really watch these th uh, three streams probably on repeat several times so that we can finally try to improve our uh, accents <laughs> when we sing <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much for watching and for listening bye thank bye. you thank you thank you tom very much good evening